Good morning and welcome back everybody to the World Economic Forum program and we're here just to start the session which we'll be discussing and looking in details at one of the most burning issues and the most burning topics here at the WEF annual gathering and in general in Europe and worldwide. European Green Deal, anyone? This is the name of the session we're about to have. With its ambition to make Europe climate neutral by 2050, the European Commission led the rollout of era-defining green <coughs> legislation during its current term, and it aims to mobilize at least 1 trillion euros in sustainable investment over the next decade. Now, as the European Green Deal faces political headwinds in the run-up to the 2024 parliamentary elections, what does the future look like? This is what we're going to be discussing here now this morning with our speakers. I'm very pleased to introduce them to you. Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Executive Vice President for European Green Deal <coughs> uh, from the European Commission from Brussels, joining us, Maro Sefkovic. Thank you very much for being here. <coughs> Esther Bajet, President and Chief Executive Officer Novozymes in Denmark, Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders, thank you. And uh, Maxim Timchenko, Chief Executive Officer DTAC Ukraine, thank you very much for being here. We will have 45 minutes for this conversation. Uh, there might be an opportunity at the end to ask a few questions. If you are following this online or if you're here in the room, please do not forget to use the official hashtag of WEF, uh, WEF24, 24 it is already. Uh, WEF24, so we can see your comments and get your questions. This is really important to get your view on this very important for all of us subject. And to start with, I would like to ask one question to all of the panelists as a scene setter, and then we can talk more in details about what you're going to say. Uh, Prime Minister, against the backdrop of European elections in a few months, uh, <coughs> political headwinds that the Green agenda is facing. Are you more bearish or are you more bullish about the future of the European Green Deal? I continue to be profoundly bullish about the future uh, of the Green Deal because when this uh, discussion uh, started a few years ago, I mean, the main argument uh, in support of the Green Deal uh, had primarily to do with the uh, importance of reducing emissions uh, uh, in order to protect the environment. Uh, we've been uh, uh, subject to catastrophic floods, for example, this, this summer, the necessity to play a leading role uh, in this transition. Since then, we've had a geopolitical shock. And it has also been uh, in incredibly clear that uh, some of the solutions offered by the Green Deal also make profound economic sense. Just uh, look, for example, at, uh, at Greece, our penetration of renewables, how cheap renewables are. I mean, there are hours during the day when we actually have uh, uh, negative prices. So I think there is uh, a, a general understanding that we need to push forward um, with this uh, agenda and essentially probably segment it into three sectors, those technologies which are already mature and, um, and competitive, where we can actually play a leading role, those technologies which may need some additional help, um, additional uh, subsidies in order uh, for them to actually be able to uh, become effective, and those technologies which are still further into the horizon where we need to be sure that at least Europe plays a leading role in terms of actually developing um, them. So from uh, the perspective of, uh, of, of Greece, and again, uh, as a country which plays a dominant role uh, in the production of electricity from uh, renewables, I continue to be um, uh, very, very um, uh, bullish about uh, the Green Deal and very much supportive of the initiatives uh, by the Commission. Uh, granted, uh, this is not something that may reflect the political realities uh, in all member states, but I think it is important uh, to highlight uh, the progress that we have been made and to add on top of that the significant uh, resources provided by the RRF regarding the green transition. For Greece, this total envelope exceeds uh, 36 billion uh, euros, um, more than 25 percent of that. Uh, is directed towards uh, the green transition. So I would argue that we also have significant uh, financial firepower from the European Union uh, in order to make that, uh, uh, that happen. Thank you so much. Uh, Executive Vice President for the European Green Deal, Interinstitutional Relations and Foresight European Commission, Mara Sepkic, your view on that. Are you more bullish or bearish? I'm, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> I'd be surprised if you were bearish. Yeah. And yet. I am bullish and, uh, and, uh, no, I am, and I am in a, in a, in a category which I, which I understand it's uh, uh, described by the political scientists as a happy warrior. You know, I mean, 
being in this business, you uh, you have to be you have to be optimistic because uh, uh, you see you know what kind of uh, um, what kind of distance we have already covered. And I totally agree with the with the, with the prime ministers that Europe was. Uh, um, really leading power in um, promoting the, the Green Deal policies, tackling the climate change. And I think every single year, every single summer, we are reminded that we have only one planet and uh, that these weather-related disasters are bearing more and more costs, uh, lots of human tragedies, and simply there is no alternative. So that's, I would say, the very big picture. But coming you know, to the economic aspect of it, I mean, the, for Europe, the Green Deal, it's our growth strategy, and through the Green Deal, uh, you see that there is actually huge international competition about what I would describe future-oriented technology. So we simply have to be there. We have to be strong <coughs> in that regard because we are not competing now who would make a better diesel car, uh, uh, diesel cars, but we are competing, you know, who would be able to store energy better, who will be able to, uh, to manufacture better EVs, how can we get more uh, renewable energy into our grids, how can we digitize them, how can we use the new technologies about which my, uh, my colleague would uh, talk in a, in a, in a moment in, uh, in, in biotech. And I think nobody disputes uh, uh, in the world, and that's my also assessment of all the talks I had here in Davos, that we really have the most advanced state-of-art legislation. What we need to develop is stronger business case for, uh, for the Green Deal, for our, for our investors. We have to be in close interaction with our citizens, uh, therefore, we started with the green dialogues. We have to listen to the CEOs of the companies across across the Europe because they will tell you, you know, we can do much more if you would remove this technological block, or if you would create real single market uh, for the for the green deal, or if we simply buy um, uh, state aid, support this or that technology because it's uh, not that mature. And I think there you see that we are also doing a lot of re uh, rethinking because we have to react on what is happening. On, on the global level. The massive subsidies offered by IRA in the U.S., of course, massive subsidies uh, 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 by which China is supporting its exports also to, towards Europe. So we are, we are adjusting uh, our policies as well, and I was quite happy that last week we did this first landmark decision uh, where uh, we authorized the state aid uh, for, the, for the North Vault uh, to actually build the next gigafactory in, uh, in Europe and not, uh, not in the EUS. And I think this would be something what we would need to think through when the uh, next College of Commissioner will sit around the table by the, by the end of the year, because the second half of this decade would be absolutely crucial on uh, positioning Europe in this very tough uh, um, uh, economic competition. Well, you said uh, we need to listen more to the CEOs. So let's do that. Uh, Esther Bajet, President and the Chief Executive Office of Novozyme Denmark, Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders. Bearish or bullish? I'm extremely pleased <laughs> of everything I heard. Otherwise, this would be a very short session. Um, but uh, maybe I can uh, build on everything I've said with the, uh, further insights or further data supporting every single comment that you've made. I believe that on times of uncertainty that we are, geopolitical uncertainty, in some cases, war uncertainty, economic uncertainty, it's when you have to be even stronger, even bolder on your direction. It's this uh, situation that we're living today, it shows the value of de-risking, the value of uh, having optionality, the value of resilience. Our dependence to fossil base, it's way too strong. And we need to bring alternatives. It is all about, I hope that's no problem. It is all about the value of uh, de-risking. It is all about the resilience of multiple options and then moving faster into that direction. The peak of fossil-based solutions, it's just here. The era of fossil-based solutions, it's over. We're going to peak fossil-based demand during this decade. So now is the time to even bolder and start investing faster on that solutions of the future, of the new era. And yes, it is green electricity, yes, it's solar, yes, it's wind, less it's hydrogen, power to X, and yes, it's biosolutions. <coughs> green Deal, it's moving all of us in the right direction. And then it's about implementation and speed and agility. Here is where we are, can do better. And can do better, it is can do better. We companies, we have the responsibility to sit at the table and show what we think good looks like and whether unnecessary roadblocks. Beautiful what you said. There are unnecessary roadblocks that make our life complex for not, no value. Let me give you a couple. We're investing uh, collectively 
8 trillion US dollars per year subsidizing the past. 8 trillion US dollars, that's 8% of the global GDP. It goes into subsidiaries, into fossil-based solutions. You don't, it's not that we're not subsidizing the future enough, it's that we're subsidizing the past. We have regulation that creates unnecessary roadblocks. It takes six years to get the permit for a windmill. It takes six to eight years to, re to register a microbe to replace fertilizers and bring sustainable agriculture. It's much faster in US. So in US it takes maybe two years mm -hmm. to register a microbe to replace fertilizers. So it's, yes, the competition with IRA from a subsidiary's point of view. There is an influx of uh, investments from Europe going into into US, into US, close to 30 projects were announced since IRA. But uh, the main driver, and that call us also part of that, and for being a European company, we're investing in US. It's not because of the subsidiaries, it's because of the demand is faster there. Mm -hmm. A regulation that accelerates the implementation of the solutions of the future, and that's where we invest. We companies, we have to invest closer to where the demand is, and we live in a global market. So, you have our commitment, and also through the CEO Climate Alliance, which is a group of CEOs that they are fully committed to reach the path neutrality, not only on how we reduce scope one and two, but also on how we lead, and on a scope three, to work, to co-create, to sit at the table, and to develop together this regulation that will move us faster and uh, unleash the potential that this geography has. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Maxim Timchenko, Chief Executive Officer, DTEC Ukraine. Bullish or bearish? Absolutely bullish. Good. And I can say from corporate corporate side, I think every single energy company incorporated Green Deal goals and mechanism into, into their strategy. And I don't think that any energy company think to exist without without being aligned with the with the European Green Deal. But from perspective of Ukraine, it's even more important. Uh, uh, second month of full scale invasion we uh, asked the world to help us. And specifically talking about synchronization of our electricity grid and connection of Ukrainian electricity grid with the European. And the request was, please help us now and we will help you in the future. Help you in building energy security of European Union and bringing more green power from Ukraine. We have enormous potential in wind and solar. Uh, we have developed infrastructure. We can be the place, as President Zelensky already said, green energy hub for Europe. That's why uh, all these plans and I believe that Green Deal uh, goals will be at core of uh, economy restoration of Ukraine after the war. And even now we, we develop all strategic plans, and as I said, not only for energy companies but for the whole economy to be aligned with, with the European Green Deal. So we have no any choice be very much bullish about that. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, let me continue with you. You mentioned during the COP28 that Greece can be provider of energy security for many European countries. How will the geopolitical landscape impact the continent's move towards green energy? First of all, may I address a very interesting point yeah. uh, that, that was made, um, uh, which I think we need to, uh, to register and listen very carefully to the business leaders developing innovative green uh, solutions. What you mentioned I think it's particularly important when it comes to uh, regulation and uh, leveraging the full potential of the single market. Uh, when you tell us that uh, it takes, uh, for example, two years to obtain the necessary registration in the US versus six years in the European Union, this is something we should take note of because we talk a lot about the single market. It is our main uh, advantage uh, when it comes to convincing companies that they should invest in Europe. But if there are bureaucratic uh, restrictions uh, uh, or bottlenecks of this type, uh, then we will be in a position of disadvantage rather than advantage when it comes to encouraging companies to invest in Europe with a primary focus on the European market. So I think this is something that we should take note of. And as we go into the next cycle of the European elections, and as we all roll out our agenda for the next uh, five years, the completion of the single market, which may seem mundane, uh, boring, bureaucratic, uh, not something that uh, may move uh, um, the, the masses towards a common goal, 
is it something which uh, should be very, very high on our priorities. Now, sorry for the digression, um, uh, because I thought the point that you raised was very, very important. Let me uh, come back to your question. Um, energy, um, security, and what could Greece's role be in this evolving uh, landscape? Uh, uh, we uh, are currently a net importer of energy. And just to put this into context, uh, when Greece decided four years ago to aggressively move away from coal, <coughs> we decided to use natural gas as a transition fuel. Uh, we don't have a nuclear, uh, so it was the only uh, obvious uh, choice. So we spent 7 billion euros in 2022 importing natural gas. And normally this uh, bill is 1 billion, just to put things uh, into, uh, into context. Uh, so we said that in the short term, we want to be an energy um, uh, provider um, uh, for at least the Balkans by building strong uh, interconnections, uh, pipelines, floating storage and regasification units uh, in northern Greece, leverage our uh, unique uh, geographic um, uh, potential, uh, possibly uh, even if necessary export um, uh, gas up to uh, Ukraine, because uh, if you actually look at the map, the distance uh, is, is not that far, but in the medium to long term, we aspire to be uh, exporters of green uh, energy by harnessing the significant potential that we have, in particular when it comes to offshore wind. If you look at the map uh, of, uh, of the Mediterranean, uh, the place where you have the maximum amount uh, of, uh, of sustained, uh, constant, strong winds is the Aegean um, Sea. So a part of our uh, medium to long term plan is to really make a breakthrough when it comes to offshore wind. But in order to do that, we also need to be the necessary interconnections. Uh, if we want to have a European market uh, of renewables that um, uh, seamlessly sends uh, energy uh, across the continent, we need to focus more uh, on grids and on interconnections. I think we realized with some delay that this is a necessary investment uh, that we can make. And if you look at the macro picture of how uh, uh, European renewable energy uh, is produced, you will uh, realize that you have a surplus of wind energy in the north uh, in the winter, and you have a surplus of solar energy uh, in, in the south in the summer. Uh, but we can still not uh, leverage mm -hmm. uh, these uh, um, uh, geographic um, um, reality. So uh, we aspire to, to play a, a leading role in the short term as providers of uh, energy security to help also some of our Balkan friends decarbonize uh, faster, but uh, we also uh, hope that we will be uh, a, a net exporter of uh, green energy uh, in the medium to, to long term. And I can tell you there is already a lot of um, uh, interest uh, uh, to invest in this sector. Finally, we should also look at uh, the interconnections with Africa. Um, Africa has uh, significant, if not unlimited, potential um, uh, to produce um, um, green uh, energy, particularly uh, from solar. We are in discussions with Egypt to build uh, a, uh, an interconnection um, uh, that will connect uh, um, uh, Greece uh, to, uh, to Egypt, and of course I think these are all projects that should be within the project of European common interest uh, uh, framework because they're not particularly important just for Greece or important for Europe as a whole. Can I, can I say, can I add? <coughs> um, thank you. And it's extremely kind and uh, responsible from you to, to, to follow up and, and bring in your comments. Let me just add one thing. It's not if it's we are losing. It's not good, it's, it's happening. Uh, the level of complexity that we're hindering in Europe, it is constraining the competitiveness and the implementation of <coughs> solutions that they already exist. There is a sense of urgency uh, that we need to all collectively bring in. And I, I fully embrace the responsibility that companies have to proactively come and not complain. This is not a complaint. This is a statement that there is a sense of urgency and there is a beautiful opportunity for Europe to capitalize on the era of the new solutions of the future. Because main leading companies sit here. This is job creation. This is wealth. The transition to a, 
to a, a green economy will increase, it's projected to increase more than 4% of the global GDP. It's $26 trillion growth that could generate. For every job in biosolutions, it's four that they're being created in the value chain. So there is an, op an opportunity here ahead of us that it's going to happen. It's in, Euro it's in Europe, in US, in China, it's going to happen. The question is, what can we do to make it here faster and not let it go somewhere else? Because the world is moving there. It's just whether jobs will be created, where that wealth will be created. Uh, Vice President, that was uh, also something I would love you to comment on first. Yeah, if you, if you allow just uh, uh, to comment on also on very important remarks of the Prime Minister, then of course uh, uh, of uh, my, my colleague to the, to the, to the left. Uh, uh, the, what I think it's uh, very important indeed is that uh, we have to uh, get our sequencing better. So we invested a lot uh, in, um, uh, in renewables. I mean, the last year we've been very proud that for the first time we produced more energy from renewables than for fossil fuels. But uh, uh, Prime Minister knows very well that very often all that potential of wind and solar we cannot use. We have so-called curtailment because our grids are not able to carry the, the, the electricity to the, to the final consumers. Because the grids do not have that capacity or because we lack <coughs> enough uh, um, interconnectors uh, uh, in, in Europe and therefore I think we, we really need uh, to make sure that we would be investing in the grids and building them uh, to be ready not for the next year but to be ready for the climate neutral future for 2050. I just said uh, with um, uh, our transmission system uh, uh, operators and I made a proposal that we should create uh, uh, something what we did for the, uh, for the batteries. Uh, uh, European Alliance for, for Batteries, which I founded uh, five years ago, we need the same alliance for the grid operators. And I'm talking, of course, about electricity, I'm talking about the gas transmission operators, and I'm talking also about uh, the hydrogen uh, uh, operators in the future, but also those who are building charging station stations, and, and then we also have to talk to the cable, cable manufacturers, substation operators, so the whole value chain, because we simply need to upgrade the grid in a way uh, which would be ready for the, uh, for the uh, climate neutral future. And coming to the technological uh, roadblocks, uh, I totally agree with you that we need uh, to focus on it as a, as, as a laser beam because I see it in, in, in uh, many aspects that we've been not too cautious or we kind of developed uh, uh, the legislations or the, or the technologies uh, several years ago and simply the advancement is, is, much, is much faster. Uh, and uh, if it comes to the complexity uh, of the decision making, I, I would say most of the complaints I hear in Davos is about permitting. And there I think it's our joint role yes. because, I mean, Indeed. very often we do not make it easier from the European level, but very often as Prime Ministers know there is also gold plate, a lot of gold plating happening on the, on the level of the member states and it has to be our joint task. So now we are creating new uh, opportunity. Uh, uh, we, we propose so-called uh, Net Zero Industry Act, where a big part of it is what can we do with the fast permitting. We want mm -hmm. to use the overriding uh, public uh, interest principle, which would help us uh, to move much faster, which uh, would, would uh, motivate us in the Commission, but also our member states, that if it comes for the strategic project, there will be sort of one-stop shop where we would help with the permitting where we would be able to provide, I would say, the guidance uh, to the market operators. How can we help you with different funds we have uh, in, in Europe? Because sometimes it's very complex and you really need, uh, you know, the, some kind of uh, agency to help you with, uh, with, with, all the, uh, with all that advice, just simply to, to make things uh, uh, much, much faster. And last point on a uh, uh, single market for the Green Deal. I totally agree with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the Prime Minister. The single market brought Europe success. Thanks to the single market, removing the internal barriers among the member states, we actually grew up the, the biggest uh, economy in the, in, in the world. And we have to make sure that it's also uh, fine-tuned to this uh, new economy of the 21st century, which is uh, built on the green technology. I'm particularly happy that we managed gradually to link up more and more Ukraine Mm -hmm. uh, to the single market. I remember when I was uh, responsible for the energy union uh, um, in, the, in the last mandate, when I was getting the advice from the experts, they were telling me that uh, to connect the electric grids between uh, Ukraine and Europe, it would take years. And then you see what we can do in Europe because war started and we did it, what, in three, four weeks? Actually. Three weeks. Three, three weeks, weeks. Which, which is remarkable. So, I mean, it just shows 
there is a huge potential mm -hmm. in European creativity. We know how to do the things. Unfortunately, sometimes we need to be pushed, but I agree with you that now we are pushed. The sense of urgency clearly is here because we see how this competition is, is heating up and we have to put our act together and to show that we can act uh, autonomously. We need to work on this strategic autonomy because the uh, world is, uh, has become a rougher place. Well, let's go, uh, Maxim Timchenko, let's go to you now because I would like you to comment on that, on, on how the possibility and how did it happen within three weeks? Because Ukraine has a specific case, obviously, nowadays. And with the EU leaders deciding to open the accession negotiations with Ukraine in December 2023, how can Ukraine contribute to supporting the continent's decarbonization efforts and the future energy security, both as a future member and today as well? Just uh, follow on from, yeah. from uh, our synchronization story. On the first day of full-scale invasion, we disconnected from uh, Russia and Belarus uh, electricity grid. It was part of our uh, three-day testing mm -hmm. as part of our synchronization process, which should be taking place in 2025. And I think that that, that day we disconnected forever. But we stay in isolated regime. So we were not connected either to, to their grid or European and war started. And I'm so grateful to our European partners, European Commission, and to all parties in the world that in three weeks' time, we managed to connect. It was emergency connection, but it still helped us to survive because we get some electricity out of Europe. And of course, after this moment, historical moment for, for our sector, we, we stated, now it's time for us to think how we can help Europe. Mm -hmm. and even now, during two years of war, we really do that. Our company built uh, 114 megawatt wind farm during the war, invested 200 million euro. Just one month ago, we announced uh, the second phase of this wind farm, uh, investing 450 million in support of uh, Denmark and, and supply of turbines from Vestas. During uh, the war, we restored transmission line with Poland so that we uh, improve our interconnection. And moreover, we Green Deal and all the goals we realize in European countries. And I'm glad for your comments, uh, Prime Minister, about Greece. Uh, country with huge potential. And today our trading company already working in the deal with LNG, bringing gas to uh, and use uh, Ukrainian gas storage, which, uh, which is the largest in Europe and bring a lot to energy security of Europe. Today, we uh, develop the first uh, battery storage project in Poland. The tech is a Ukrainian company. Uh, last uh, month, we commissioned first wind farm built in Romania for the last 10 years as a Ukrainian company, bringing all engineering from Ukraine. Just some examples what can be done during the war and what role Ukraine can play, even under current circumstances. So, I think that Green Deal and all the goals we, we discuss here will be driving force for Ukraine and will be one of the important factors of European integration of our country, starting from reforms and I think most of economic reforms we need to do one or other uh, way they're connected with the European Green Deal, through to investments, uh, foreign companies coming to Ukraine, potential we can realize. And basically, that's, that's the foundation of our future. Thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the company, Star. Let me ask you here. Uh, the private sector is responsible for over 80% of greenhouse gas emissions in the European Union. Um, in light of these political headwinds, will it have to be the private sector that takes a leadership role in advancing the ambitions of the European Green Deal moving forward with, given everything we have heard, of course, from Prime Minister and uh, Marisev Kovic? Um, I think the private sector, and uh, this, this forum is a, is a beautiful example of that, it's taking its fair share of responsibility, which is extremely strong. Um, a, a beautiful example is the CEO Climate Alliance that I am in, and I have the privilege to, and the honor to co-chair. This is a group of uh, more than 100 CEOs Collectively, we represent a, a revenue of uh, more than four trillion US dollars, and also your CO2 emissions uh, that are quite relevant for the overall world. We have collectively committed to reduce our CO2 emissions of a scope one of two, get remove emissions with the same magnitude of the emissions of Japan, 
and we're moving forward in that direction. Since we started our Embracit, our journey, we have already reduced the emissions faster than the globe. Is that fast enough? Obviously not, but we're moving faster than the globe. What I'm extremely pleased about uh, the power of this coalition, it is not only the CO2 emissions that we reduce, it is also the ones that we invite others to reduce. If you think about the top biggest thousand companies, the top thousand companies, their scope three emissions, so the emissions of their suppliers, mm -hmm. they are 25% of the global emissions of the globe. So there is a immense potential to have an impact, not only on what you do, but also on what you ask the people that supplies you. And by triggering that dialogue, by asking your suppliers to invite them to move into to CO2 emission reduction, that's when you multiply your effect. So yes, I fully agree. And I, I mean, in the company that I am in, uh, we are fully embedded in that direction. We have uh, in Novozymes, since we started this journey, since 2018, reduced the CO2 emission 68% while increasing the revenue 25%, 24%. More than 20%, because we have not published it yet. So around two, a little bit more than 20%. Um, and then, also without compromising the margins. So I think it's very important to have in perspective that doing the right thing for the planet, doing the right thing for the society, it's also doing the right thing for your shareholders. And it's also a driver of growth. Because you're investing on the solutions of the future. And that's what drives sustainable growth. And at the same time, it gives you the right to attract the very best talent. Because the talent of the future will only want to work in the companies that they feel that they belong, that they feel that they are proud. So having values. values. So investing on the future, investing on the solutions where there's going to be demand, I think that's a check, good thing for companies to do. Attracting the very best people, I also believe it's key important milestone for uh, delivering shareholder value. So there is a strong commitment and a need for companies to continue to transform on the Green Deal, to continue to uh, move in the right direction, because that's the way that we generate shareholder value creation, and that's the way also that we contribute to the globe. I would like only to make one comment. We're talking a lot about energy, which is extremely relevant. We have to fit the, fool the wall more sustainably and decouple from a fossil base. But we also have to fit the wall. So let's, let's, uh, let's uh, keep both in balance, that it's extremely important that we also realize there is an increase of protein demand that's going to double in the next years, that cannot be fulfilled by the solutions of the past, that we need sustainable agriculture, that Ukraine is also heavily investing, that we need plant-based uh, solutions, that we need more novel ways of how we feed uh, um, and, um, cows and cattles without, while reducing the methane emissions. Mm -hmm. that is, it's not great focus on full, yes, but also remember on feeding the world sustainably and on moving into a, that future ahead of us with respect to the climate and to the nature. If, if I can make a few comments on, uh, um, on top of what was said, and I totally agree with that, is that I think we, and I think that's a very important message for, for our audience uh, here, and I, I believe that we, we share it with the, with the Prime Minister, that we in, in Europe, we are prepared and ready to fight for our economy and to fight for our industry. We want our companies not only to stay, but to prosper in Europe. And, and clearly what we need to do for that is that uh, we need to improve the business case uh, for many of the policies and technologies we are developing uh, in Europe. I'm a strong believer in using as often as possible so-called uh, competitive sustainability principle. By what I mean that if you are, let's say, using uh, public uh, procurement, we cannot look at the price as the only criteria. We clearly deployed it with the battery regulation. We adopted a couple of weeks ago the wind energy package, where we clearly stated that we would like to frame the public procurement uh, um, in the future in a way that we have to reward the companies which have low carbon footprint, which are operating in a sustainable manner, which are treating their workers decently. Mm. And we have to reward these values and not to punish them that then we, then we buy the cheapest alternative which comes somewhere from Asia. Because otherwise we will not kind of promote mm. this smart way future-oriented way, how to produce, how to manufacture, and we always would go to the lowest common denominator, which is, which is price. And then, and then we have to change because 
uh, Europe is the economy where we create high value added and we simply have to also adjust uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the policies in, 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 that, in, in that regard. And I, I totally agree with you that energy is important, but of course Green Deal has many more aspects. And, uh, um, we have to be very sensible, uh, sensitive if it comes to, to agriculture because uh, we know uh, 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 how important it is uh, uh, to also have forward-looking uh, policies uh, in the agro sector, how we need to interact very intensively with our agriculture community, with uh, those who are looking after our forests, because, I mean, um, they are guardian of the nature, they, they are the major sinks for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the carbon, and we have, to, we have to also listen to them and look for the, uh, for the, for the good, good solution for them. And maybe last, last point, which I think will be a very, very important, is how to use the political and economic weight of the, of the European Union. Just two examples, I think we did extremely well with the common purchase of vaccines. I'm also responsible for the common purchase of gas, and I think we should use this uh, mechanism uh, um, always when it fits. So we are putting together the framework for common purchase of critical raw materials. We would like to do the same for, for hydrogen, simply to benefit from the fact that we are major economy, a biggest trading bloc in the world, and we should use that economic weight simply to, to get better deals from the, from the international suppliers. Thank you. If, if I could just add um, two points. First of all, just to build upon what you said regarding uh, the, the leverage that we have, which sometimes we, we seem to be reluctant uh, to use. We had discussions at the level of the European Council during the big energy crisis of uh, 2022. And it took us months and months and months um, uh, to, to agree, you know, the Council, you know, with, uh, with the support of the Commission, which actually had come in yes. favour of the solution um, uh, way, way before others realised its importance to place, for example, a cap on natural gas and to use um, our, our, our power as, as big buyers uh, uh, of gas to address what was clearly uh, an obvious market distortion. So we did it, but we didn't do it fast enough. On the other hand, when it came to COVID and, and, and vaccines and the RRF, we were incredibly uh, effective. And when it comes to supporting our, uh, our, our businesses and improving European competitiveness, let me just flag one, one concern which uh, I have representing a, you know, a medium-sized uh, European country that is just now emerging from uh, a very painful 10-year. Um, uh, crisis. We have done a lot at the European level to pool European funds um, uh, to support strategic priorities of the European Union, the Green Deal being one of them, and that is the next generation EU. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, the restrictions and the conditionalities imposed by the European Commission are incredibly strict. So as big recipients uh, of uh, RRF funds, we need to do our homework yeah. and we need to be extremely diligent in terms of making sure that uh, what we submit to the European Com uh, Commission meets the strict regulation that was, uh, that was put in place. But this is a, a European solution, and we have distributed uh, the funds based on uh, tested European principles. Uh, on the other hand, we have state aid. Uh, and uh, we know that we relaxed state aid rules uh, during uh, COVID, and I think we probably did, obviously did the right thing. But may I just argue that uh, uh, the, the solution uh, is not a significant relaxation of state aid rules to support companies in countries that have the fiscal space to actually do so. Because if you look at where the state aid money went, 75% went to two countries. This is at the, uh, distorting uh, the single market uh, uh, in favor of those countries that actually have uh, uh, stronger economies. So I would very much... Uh, urge us to um, uh, to keep uh, uh, the balance right. I'm not saying that we should not rethink our competition um, uh, rules, but uh, we need to be uh, aware of the fact that there are countries that have the fiscal space um, uh, to uh, support their companies, whether, uh, whereas there are other countries that simply do not have uh, this uh, uh, capacity, and this is something that needs to be acknowledged. Thank you. Um I'm going to do the final question here, because this is something that I want to ask all of the speakers, please, to answer this one. Uh, with the 
legislative framework for the European Green Deal, if we focus on this, is largely set. I want you to comment on how can its implementation be accelerated in a socially just way, because this is another very important aspect. Marisov, could yeah. you start, please, on this? Yes, and I would I love you to... Gladly, because, I mean, it's absolutely important. Without public support, there will be no Green Deal. Without socially... Uh, fair uh, uh, transition, you will very quickly um, hate uh, the, the, the political obstacles and, and I think the uh, Prime Minister is a very experienced politician, so I'm sure uh, he, he feels the same what I feel, that there is anxiety build up in our society. Simply, I mean, we went through a very difficult period. We had the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we have energy crisis, we have uh, war in Ukraine, we have another war south of our uh, borders and and, and 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 I feel that anxiety uh, in the society which is linked with what would be the cost of living standards. I would cope with all the challenges ahead of us, and therefore we have to be absolutely conscious that uh, we need uh, uh, to make uh, this uh, green transition and implement a green deal in a, in an absolutely socially uh, fair manner. One of the, the instruments we build in the system is a is a social uh, climate fund which should be operational already in. Uh, two years' time, which would be in a tune of uh, more than 80, 80 billion euros. And I think it would be up to the European leaders, uh, the, the heads of states and government, and the Commission to kind of uh, uh, prepare the use of this fund uh, in a way that uh, we are able to, to help those uh, who are most affected uh, by the, by the uh, green transition, um, also in, uh, I would say, the, the, the financial, financial way, because this would clearly be very, very important. Because you because, uh, and then I think, and I totally agree again with the, with the statement that we cannot do it without private business, without the industry, without the creativity which, uh, uh, which private uh, capital brings uh, um, uh, to the table, because uh, I just came across with a very good, uh, I would say, new financial mechanism, which I would describe as a, as a green leasing. The people are worried, you know, I have to change the boiler, heat pump is very expensive, how, how I'm going to do it? But there are the companies across the Europe already offering you the complete solution that will be build uh, the heat pump into your house, and they're not going to charge you for it this enormous sum. They will lease it for you on a monthly payment, which is acceptable, which is fine. The same thing we have to do with uh, uh, EVs with other technologies, and we have to find a way how we would help these type of companies to the risk, to offer counter guarantees, to use EIB uh, in, a, in, a, in a more creative way, to bring much more financial uh, firepower into this transition that we would kind of um, address these this social concerns which are clearly there because without public support uh, in democratic societies like we have in Europe, you, you simply cannot pursue the policies. Thank you. Uh, Maxim, could you, uh, Maxim Timchenko, could you please comment on this? On Because Ukraine has another, it's a different dimension when it comes to the social just way of implement, implementing the transition. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we are in a situation where we have, have to balance. Coal mining and, and coal power generation play a crucial role in national security at the moment. In generation mix, we, we have about 25 to 27 percent. And we cannot, we cannot in one day change it. And we have thousands of coal miners working in Ukraine at the moment. From the other side, Ukraine is committed to follow all uh, standards and regulations coming from Europe. Committed with CBAM. Uh, ETS to be implemented in Ukraine in, in time frame we agreed. So for us, it's extremely important that it's done in a fair way for the next 10 years. We don't ask for exclusion from the rules, but we, we need some time for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, taking, uh, taking as an example our company, we are the major coal producer in the country, but at the same time we are the major renewable company. And it takes us many years to move from coal to renewables, wind and solar in Ukraine and building battery storage. So as it was already mentioned, Ukraine is playing a very important uh, role in security of Europe. So we, we talk about energy security, definitely defense, it's clear for everybody. Food security is already uh, was said, but I think Ukraine can play an important role in supply chain security, moving production to Ukraine. And that's another example how the social way, how we can train our people released from, from coal industry or other industries not, not aligned with, with the green and, and build new, new production, new manufacturing, solar panels or parts of wind turbines or, or, or any, any other way with such a skilled people with, with uh, such a background in engineering, in production we, we have in the country. 
But, uh, first, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yes, sir, briefly on this, please. On the, um, on how to do this implementation in a socially just way, and then you're going to have to comment to him. Sorry, because you mentioned also earlier that it's not, you know, it is very important, the factor, how it is the right thing for society as well and for people. I, want yeah, you to, I know, but I want you to develop it, but briefly, though. Um, um, we have to continue to stay firm on where we're going without blinking. But then we should not jump unconsciously. There is a strong dependence to fossil base that we cannot simply ignore. Then the investments need to be for the future. Every single investment needs to be for green energy, for solar, for wind, for methane, for power to X. Injecting the, ca the cash, the investments, on the ca these precious dollars, these precious euros, on the solutions of the future. Same for food, for agriculture, investments on regenerative agriculture, investments on plant-based protein, investments on what are we going to move faster to this moving the air of fossil base behind us. This should be a gradual move. And that will generate growth and that will generate jobs. But the comment on the talent and the employees is extremely, extremely important. And maybe also building on the single market, the single market of goods, single market of people, it's becoming harder. I mean, there's pensions from every country. That is, we, when we say single market, we please think bold on what single market means. So we can really leverage the talent that we have within our, within our country and bring the best out of it. Because we need different, the skill sets of the future are going to be different from the skill sets of the past, in the same way that they're different from the skill set of 2,000 years ago. But we need to gradually move there, and the mobility across our country is going to move us faster there. Thank you, Prime Minister. Well, I'm not going to take any time. No, I, th I think do. we're right out of time, but... Uh, I know, that's fine, but it's one, on me, please. One, one minute on call. Um, we have uh, reduced our production of electricity from coal by 90%. This has affected one particular region of Greece, because coal is <laughs> Sorry. Really a very regional, a very local problem. And you need to commit significant resources, we have our Just Transition <laughs> Fund, to help build a better future for these regions. This is a given. Otherwise, it will simply not happen. The resistance is going to be massive. And second, start when you want to build public support. Start with the obvious win-win solutions. Retrofitting houses, for example, is a win-win um, uh, uh, proposal. Uh, we have used uh, European funds uh, um, very effectively uh, in, in this direction. Or go to a small island and explain to them why decarbonizing is actually easier than they think. If you build a PV plant, there may be some resistance at the beginning, but when they see the electricity bills and they realize they pay much less uh, for electricity, you will start building uh, support. So start with the quick wins and be very careful with agriculture because agriculture in its own uh, is a very, very complex topic, very difficult to, um, to, to decarbonize, and we need to be very sensitive when it comes to reactions from our farmers. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kyriakos Mitsudakis, Prime Minister of Greece, Maros Sefkovic, uh, European Commission Executive Vice President for the European Green Deal, Azerbaijan President and Chief Executive Officer Novozymes, and Maxim Timchenko, Chief Executive Officer DTAC. Thanks a lot to the speakers and thanks for everybody here.